one thief <laughs> had, a, had a pistol, the usual word, Tim, sitting on his lap on his right hand leg, sitting right over there. And my mother started to give him a lecture like she would to her son saying, like, you realize what you're doing is wrong. You realize this is no way to make a living. You realize, you know, you're eventually going to get caught. You know, you'll end up paying a price. You'll end up being in jail. You got to find some other way to, you know, to provide for yourself and your life. I mean, she was giving this, you know, guy a lecture on life and he's sitting there with a gun in his life. And finally he turned to her and he said, you know, ma'am, she would just please shut up. So, so I, I think my mother at that point was, you know, was was quiet. I think she finally stopped talking. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books an NFL first round pick with an eight year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Arthur Blank, you are best known for co-founding The Home Depot and for owning the NFL's Atlanta Falcons, my alma mater. But people might be surprised that you credit not focusing on the bottom line to your business success. Rather, you focus on the internal team, individuals who you call associates, and you demand that they treat each customer like family. You also set aside money for them to give back to their communities so that they fully experience serving others. This began with your mother. Could you tell us why that is and what it means to you? Well, um, first of all, Tim, it's... um it's always an honor and a privilege uh, uh, to be with you and, and your son, Troy, and um, had a moment there to say hi to Alyssa and um, indirectly to all your children. And I was on the phone a minute ago with my middle son, Joshua, who asked to say hello to everybody, too. And so we're this is like this is more like a discussion than an interview. This is family. <laughs> so. Um, you know, I would say, Tim, uh, there's so many truths in what you just expressed um, so beautifully that um, you know, the notion, uh, I think, that I came out of my early childhood with from primarily from my mother, some to be my dad, but I lost my father when I was 15, was that, you know, we travel through life once and uh, we have um, more over than a responsibility and opportunity to give give back and make a difference in other people's lives, and and um, and we do that uh, with how we live our lives, um, how we work, how we play, how we connect in family, how we connect in community. Um, all of those things uh, represent you know the very best of us. And really, at the end of the day, as I've gotten older, and and Tim, you're a little more advanced than when you played for uh, our Atlanta Falcons. You know, uh, you realize the importance of of those relationships and the relationships of of uh, touching people in their heart and um, and their head and their soul in terms of uh, their why in life. You know, what's important to them? Why do they do what they do? Uh, and so, all of our businesses, um, and we offer service, you know, to guests through our uh, ranches in Montana and. You and your family have been with us a number of times at Mountain Sky, and we do it through our PGA Tour Superstores, which is the largest golf specialty retailer in the world today uh, with great golf experiences and, you know, creating a family social network for them for their enjoying golf with uh, other friends and family um, and themselves personally. And obviously with our football team and our soccer team as well, 
in really creating that sense of community for all the fans that come, that we want them to feel like this is their home and feel connected to the franchises in every way. And obviously, finally, through our family foundation, uh, with our grantees, but really more importantly, with the individuals that our grantees serve um, and support. So, um, you know, my life is um, really designed around giving back, uh, which is a deep-seated expression my mother felt strongly about. Uh, it's about making a difference in other people's lives, um, young and old. But I would say that um, much of my commitment is on the youth side of things. Uh, youth represent, you know, a third of our population and a hundred percent of our hope. So um, uh, we could talk for hours about any of any of those elements. But um, I know you've lived your life very much the same way. So I know I'm talking to not only a dear friend but my brother. Um, and, uh, so it's always an honor to be with you, Tim. So I hope that broadly answers your question. And our associates, I would say this, which you brought up, they feel that connection. They feel it every day when they go, I wouldn't even say to work because we try our associates. We want them not to feel like it's work, like it's really going to a place that has purpose, whether it's the guests, fans, uh, uh, grantees uh, who we serve in the community. Um, we want them to feel that purpose, um, and and that's very important. Uh, so I think that's really critical to them feeling part of, of the family, if you will. And then, you know, we, we uh, do a lot in terms of philanthropy. Uh, we're up to probably close to a billion and a half dollars at the end of this year and probably be at two and a half billion dollars in the next 10 years. Um, but we do some of it, some part of it, with our associate giving funds, which is what you alluded to, where each of our businesses get X amount of dollars every year, and uh, we ask our associates to make the decisions in terms of how do they evaluate uh, you know, needs in their communities, needs that they see. They make the allocation decisions. They make the evaluation decisions. They stay in touch with grantees. So... You know, that gives them an actual hands-on experience in terms of what does philanthropy feel like and how do you feel and see that difference you're making in people's lives. When people see your success, it's easy to forget that you grew up in humble surroundings. Please tell us what that was like. Also, you grew up with an older brother, Michael. What was your relationship like growing up? Um, I would say, you know, we had a really good relationship growing up. It's interesting, Tim, um, because you know my family well. Um, and um, I would say my relationship with my brother today probably has gotten even better over time. I think as we both uh, matured and aged and, and uh, learned to appreciate life more you know, holistically um, and see it in a broader lens than we necessarily saw when we were young, um, I think it's even gotten better. Um, so when we were young, I mean, we had our differences, but we uh, we got along beautifully, I would say. Uh, it was not easy for my mother, uh, being a single parent, majority of our teen years. I was 15 at the time. My dad passed away, and my brother's two and a half years older than I am, so, you know, slightly older. But it was very difficult for my mother to raise two, you know, young, young men, um, you know, leaving high school, in high school, going on to college, et cetera, and dealing with the challenges. And at the same time, um, you know, my dad had started uh, an entrepreneur. He started his own pharmaceutical distribution business and uh, was putting a lot of hours into that when he passed away. My mother, without any business background, uh, picked up, you know, picked up that opportunity, that challenge, and, uh, and continued to run the business very successfully and grew it and then eventually uh, sold it to a large company that I went to work for for a short period of time and had an opportunity to work with my mother and brother for a, a short period of time, not too long. Um, and I would say that, you know, that probably was, you know, a little bit of a stressful time in my life. It's uh, if you can work with your family, it's great. Uh, it's a blessing. You're smiling, Tim. <laughs> so, so you can relate to this a little bit. Maybe Troy can too. I'm not sure, but uh, I mean, it is a blessing. And obviously, you work with your whole family. 
but it also, you know, it creates some tension, I think, sometimes that you don't necessarily have in a, in a workplace, in a normal workplace. But um, today, my relationship with my brother is outstanding and uh, speak to him usually three or four times a week um, and look forward to, you know, keeping up with each other and visit him as often as I can. Arthur, when your uh, father passed away, was it sudden or was your mom ready for the uh, the challenge of trying to take over the business? Mm-hmm. My father um, had uh, had heart disease, Troy, um, and this was you know long time ago. He passed away in 1957, I think it was. So uh, I may have the year wrong, but let's say 57. Um, a long time ago. I think at that point, uh, they didn't know much about heart disease. They gave you some aspirin, gave you some oxygen, uh, told you to rest, told you to stay home. Uh, He did all of that. He had one heart attack, uh, which um, uh, he got through. Uh, The second one turned out to be uh, to be fatal. Um, And my mother was not, you know, was not at all prepared to run the business, hadn't spent any time in the business. She was aware of what my dad was doing because he worked very long hours. He worked as a pharmacist for many years for his brother, actually, uh, in a drugstore. Um, and then he went out on his own to start this distribution business. But uh, my mother was not really prepared for it. You know, and she was, you know, I never realized at the time how young my mother really was. She was 37 when my father passed away. My dad was 44. Um, I didn't realize how young 44 was. I was 15. I'm 37, you know, never realized how young that was. Um, so, you know, um, the loss was um, obviously um, tremendous for the family in every every way you could imagine. Um, but we dealt with it and we moved on. And I have very fond memories of my father. My father was a track person. I have a... a uh, little medal here on my desk someplace. He went to Columbia University and um, in their version of whatever track meet it was, he won the gold medal in the 100-yard dash and the one-mile run, which, you know, you're an athlete, Troy, played ball at a high level and obviously damn, dad does and did. Um, and to understand that one person could run, win a, a first place That's in the 100-yard lot. dash and a one-mile run was like crazy. So that was my father. So that really probably is in my genes as a runner. Um, and now, uh, you know, all well, my kids really are pretty athletic just generally. Um, different levels of different things, but uh, they're all pretty athletic too. Many people don't know this, but when you were young, you had a stutter. How did that impact you and how and when did you defeat that stutter? Well, I, it's a... Uh, um, very interesting that, you know, the phraseology defeat. Um, so I would say um, a, a good a good percentage of, of people who stutter, it, it's a, it has a genetic, genetic tendency to it. Not totally, but a genetic tendency to it. So my one of my uncles had a stutter. Uh, my brother has a stutter. My little guy Max has a bit of a stutter, uh, et cetera, and I and I have, um, and I'm what's called a veil stutter. So I'll flip words around, switch words around. Most of you guys, like Tim or Troy, you guys have known me forever, and you may not even know that I stutter. Most people don't. They say, "Wow, what are you?" But it's really, um, I think, the work that we do with um, with Dr. Courtney Bird is probably the leading researcher in stuttering in the world today. Um, there's a major center in Austin, Texas. We opened up one here in Atlanta. Uh, her camps are, are run nationally and internationally, probably 25 countries this year. Um, the philosophy is one that you actually, the word defeat is not part of the conversation. So it's maybe the first time in my life I've ever corrected Tim Green. Uh, so you just, you know, the her research and 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 space is that um and her philosophy is dream speak live dream speak live that people like tim green or troy or myself or anybody who may stutter or not stutter has dreams uh 
and you have to be able to speak to be able to live live those dreams out to be able to communicate those and then to live your life fully so stuttering should not define you stuttering is like you know i have graying hair troy i used to have black hair like you um you know your dad has a more of a beard than i have but that just makes us different so Stuttering is just a difference. It's not a. It's not a disability. It's not a uh, hardship. Um, and folks who stutter, um, they have the same hopes, dreams, aspirations for their lives. And so, the work that Dr. Bird does, and we support um, the research and the clinical work that's being done, is to really show people that you know what you say is important. It's one of the things I got from my mother early on. Um, is that my mother would often say to me, you speak up because people want to hear what you have to say and what you have to say is important. So take your time, speak up and, and people will listen to you. And, um, you know, I ended up, Tim, it's not, you know, you never really cured from stuttering, but I ended up, you know, finding, putting myself in positions and you guys know me so well, Tim and Troy, um, that i put myself in positions where I was going to be challenged or I was going to want to deal with the challenge. So like in college, I mean, I would sit in the front row of virtually every class and I would raise my hand and kids would say, oh boy, here goes a five minute question to what should be a two minute question or a one minute question, et cetera. But I always did it. I continued to do it. So I got more comfortable with it. And then obviously as I moved on in my business chapters and success and career, you know, I've had the opportunity and the need really to speak up frequently on issues and certainly in my role today with the NFL or the PGA Tour or whatever it may be, I have opportunities to do that as well and needs to do that as well and certainly after the foundation or Atlanta United. So um, I know what I have to say is important. Um, I know I can be a little bit redundant because often stutters will do that. They'll tend to say the same thing twice because they want to make sure they're being heard properly. But the whole notion of Dr. Bird's work is is that um, you, whether you stutter or not, it's really not really not important. What you have to say and what you're thinking about and what your spirit and heart wants to express is important. And you need to have those dreams, express those feelings. People will listen to you and live a full life in every sense of the word. And um, and you know. She does these camps where 70, 100 kids show up, and at the end of the camp, after a week, kids are grabbing a microphone and making a speech, and they know they're going to stutter, and they don't care. And that's and that's really the position you want to be in. They just don't care because they know what they have to say is important, and it ref reflects their thinking. So um, take the word the, 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 the feet out, Tim. That's good to know. Arthur, let's talk about your parents. Your dad was a pharmacist who began the wholesale drug business right. before his passing at the age of 44 when you were just 15. That must have been traumatic for you. What do you miss most about him? Well, I would say, Tim, I, I miss, you know, sharing my life with him um, and sharing, knowing him more as an adult. I mean, when I was only 15 and Troy can relate to this and, and your kids, all your kids can, I mean, um, you know, at age 15, you don't really know your parents, you know them, but you don't really know them as adults, if you will. So I miss that passage in time where I could uh, appreciate, uh, learn from my father as an adult, et cetera, share my personal, you know, uh, life journey with him, share my business life journeys with him, uh, be able to look back and reflect and and uh, be able to have him know my family, my six beautiful children, my six grandchildren, uh, spouses, et cetera. So, you know, I, I miss all of that, uh, you know, tremendously. Um, and again, as I said earlier, um, when you're 15 years old, 44 seems like, doesn't seem old, but it seems like, well, that's a long way away. But you realize as time goes on, I mean, I'll be, 82, Tim, in a couple of weeks, believe it or not. So that's like unbelievable to me. I mean, when I say the words, I always say, how did I get to be 82 years old? I mean, that like, I must have jumped like 20 years in there some someplace. I'm not sure how that happened, but it happened. 
but um, you know, I, I, I think you, uh, you, you really, you miss the wisdom of your parents. And even my mother who um, lived to be, you know, four months short of a hundred, um, you know, today I still have conversations with her. I still have conversations with my father today. Um, you know, a lot of times people, I used to run a lot. I ran, you know, relatively competitively for probably 40 years or so. And uh, I never ran with a headset on, never ran listening to anything. Uh, and I still today, when I walk, I don't uh, listen to anything. But, but I try to listen to myself and hear my brain, hear my mind, hear, my, you know, hear what my spirit is talking to me about. And lots of times, I mean, I would still and still do today have conversations. I mean, I still do to today have conversations with my mother and father about my life, uh, about what I'm thinking, what would they be thinking, what would their counsel be to me at this point in my life about whatever would be something personal, something professional. Um, so, you know, that interchange and that growing as a child to a parent and a parent to a child, uh, both ways really, um, uh, that really never changes. Even though neither of them are here, I feel many, many times they actually are still here with me. Meanwhile, your mom, who had a college degree but no formal business training, took over operating at your family's business and helped it thrive, leading to her ultimately selling the right. company to a retail conglomerate. Did you offer any assistance to your mother while you were at Babson College preparing to right. be an accountant? Well, I think, you know, it was interesting. My brother um, went to the University of Michigan um, and he got his degree in pharmacy there. And I went to a small business school called Babson College, which is, you know, one of the top uh, 10 colleges, I think, in the country today, one of the top entrepreneurial colleges today. At that time, it wasn't. I'm not sure I could get in today, but I did then. Um, but um, but I think that, um, you know, along the way, we made decisions that we both would try to get degrees in areas that might be helpful to run the family business if we chose to both go into it. And we did for a period of time. I actually worked for a large public accounting firm, Arthur Young & Company. My youngest daughter, Kylie, who you all know, uh, she works for Ernst & Young, which is the uh, subsequent firm to it. And um, uh, so I think along the way, I gave her counsel and support as much as I could. I was busy going to school, busy with my own life, growing. Uh, in every way that a young man does grow. And, uh, but I did, you know, once I left off the young, I spent, you know, some time there, some years there. And I really think uh, the sale of business was the very best thing uh, for my mother. Uh, it was the best thing because it gave her the financial security uh, for the rest of her life. Uh, so she was free to uh, live a full life and do all the things that she wanted to do. And, and she was always very philanthropic. When she had no money, she was philanthropic, philanthropic with her time and her energy and uh, whatever resources she had, which were limited. Turned out, you know, subsequent years, it was not as limited. And then she was very generous. And still is today. We still operate the, the Molly Blank Fund with trustees and my brother and I. And uh, because of the success of the Home Depot stock over the years, we've been able to give away several multiples of the um, – of the amount of money that she left us left for the fund. So it was great. Arthur, I'm just curious the the business when she took it over, did it maintain, did it increase, did it go down at all? Or actually, how, no, how did it, didn't, it? it didn't decrease. It actually grew. Um, and I like a lot of that joy was my mother's, uh, I would say her will and her tenacity. I remember she much like myself, she was more of a night person. I used to be a morning person now, much more of a night person. So I'll often be working until 11, 12 o'clock at night. Um, and my mother would do that. And my mother would, you know, come in at maybe 10 o'clock in the morning and she'd work till 10, 11 o'clock at night. And um, and that did create some stress for me because um, uh, Diana and I were married then. We had our firstborn, Kenny, um, who's now in his 50s. And... Uh, and, um, you know, after a certain, after a long day, I wanted to go home. I wanted to be home and she would still be working. So I'd say, look, well, mom, I hate to leave you here, but I actually have my wife at home and my firstborn's at home and I, it's your grandson and I need to be home with them tonight. But 
So that was one of the dynamics I think you have in a family business, which can be a little bit uh, different. Um, but uh, but it worked out great. And um, um, I saw the you know the one thing with my mother, she was incredibly uh, resilient. Uh, she we all have adversity in life. We all have trauma in life. We all have things we have to overcome in life or deal with. Uh, everybody does, and it's part of the journey of life. Uh, and I think she handled hers really, really well. And she grew through adversity, um, faced the challenges that she had, and figure out ways to uh, to navigate through them, over them, around them, uh, to get on to the other side and keep going and keep growing. So uh, I learned that lesson, I think, from her at an early age. I met your mother at your beautiful ranch in Montana. She was a pistol. So I can believe this story, but mm -hmm. did she really lecture a burglar while he was tying her up? Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Uh, she she was uh, she was a pistol, and the pistol is part of the story. So uh, you, you got a great memory, Tim. But um, I was, you know, I don't know, maybe I was 11, 12 years old. My brother would have been two and a half years older. Mom, my dad was still alive. The two burglars got my bro my father confused with his brother. At that time, cash, which nobody uses anymore today, was actually the major commodity when you went shopping, whatever. So they thought that my father, being my brother, had taken home, being his brother, had taken home the cash receipts from the drugstore and brought it to our apartment where we live, which was about a block and a half away. So it was Sunday morning. Um, they Somebody knocked on the door. My father didn't look through the peephole in our apartment. Came in, heard there was a bike in the hallway, fell down. Came in and saw that um, that a gentleman, a gentleman, a, a, a thief, a robber, uh, had a gun to my father's head, and oh, no. and I still remember him saying, you know, to my dad something about, you know, just cooperate. If not, I'm gonna blow your brains out. Some version of that. So it was like, I was like twelve years old. God, what is it now? So. Um, they sat my mother and my brother and myself in our, it was, a, it was a one bedroom apartment with one bathroom, which the four of us shared. My mother and dad slept on a pull out little sofa thing in the foyer. And uh, they sat us down in the one other room we have, which was a small living room. And um, they walked my father around the apartment looking for, quote, the money, if you will. And uh, I mean, one gentleman, gentleman, I used the word gentleman again. Uh, so uh, one thief <laughs> had, a, had a pistol, to use your word, Tim, sitting on his lap on his right-hand leg, sitting right over there. And my mother started to give him a lecture like she would to her son, saying, like, you realize what you're doing is wrong. You realize this is no way to make a living. You realize, you know, you're eventually going to get caught. You know, you'll end up paying a price. You'll end up being in jail. You got to find some other way to, you know, to provide for yourself in your life. I mean, she was giving this, you know, guy a lecture on life, and he's sitting there with a gun in his life. And finally, he turned to her and he said, "You know, ma'am, should we just please shut up?" So, <laughs> so I, I think my mother at that point was, you know, was was quiet. Uh, I think she finally stopped talking. And I remember they they went to the apartment. It didn't take very long because it's a very small apartment. Uh, one of the guys took me, uh, and I won't use the word gentleman again, one of the guys took me into the bathroom and, and put me in the tub and uh, started to tape my mouth shut. Um, we tied up our hands and all that stuff. And uh, and I, I can't repeat. I mean, I would repeat if we weren't doing a podcast, but I used a full letter word starting with F. Um and I remember the guy saying to me to this day, and I was, you know, I was 12 years old, maybe I was 11 or 12, saying to this day, she said to me, if I told your mother what you just said, she would wash your, your, your mouth out with soap. <laughs> so, so I said, so I remember, oh, God. So I, I guess I didn't you know, say anything, but I ended up, I was very, uh, very proud that I was the first one of the four of us after they left and they realized there was no money there. They left, didn't shoot anybody, didn't hurt anybody, you know, other than the story and emotionally and uh, ended up got out of my, you know, the knot they tied me in and got the tape off me and untied everybody else. And 
what I have you. But it was um, it was a crazy experience. But that was my mother, Tim. I mean, she she didn't care if you had a pistol. She was a pistol, and she just had a bigger pistol, which was her, uh, as compared to anybody she was talking with. So um, thank you for did remembering they, that. Yeah. Did they catch the guys? They did eventually. Yes. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks later, as I remember, it wasn't very long. So it, so. He got lectured by your mom, and he heard you curse. He knew that yeah, you were yeah, more scared uh, of him than the you were more, yeah. more scared of her than his pistol. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing, Tim, that you you uh, uh, you would remember. I mean, my mother did visit the ranch several times, or a number of times actually. But even uh, the last time she came, I remember she was probably. Gosh, she probably had to be in her early 90s, I think, uh, when she came. And uh, we had a chance to meet you, you Tim. And uh, another little quick funny story relative to her being there. One of our guests for a number of years in a row was Steven Spielberg. Uh, and Steven, Steven would come with his wife and his eight children, as I remember, and one caregiver. And um, my mother was a big fan of Steven Spielberg. Personally, he had a great relationship with his mother. Um, and, um, and she wanted to hear about his movies and, um, he was so kind. I remember, uh, he'd come over and sit with her and he would hold her hand and, uh, talk to her about the movies that she liked that he did. And, um, so, um, it's one of the things you realize in life as early as you can, hopefully that kindness matters. Uh, no matter who you are and when when you can express it and when you can show it, it's a great thing, great virtue. So, and she was always wowed by that. What is your favorite memory from your childhood? Yeah, somebody else asked me that recently too. Um, that's a very hard question, Tim. I might could flip it around and ask you or Troy the same question, <laughs> or <laughs> brothers and sisters. But but uh, uh, I mean, I you know. Gosh, um, I, I think, you know, I think the family time we spent together. Uh, my father at that time uh, worked very long hours as a pharmacist. Uh, wasn't even that necessarily working for my, his brother made it hard, but just the people worked much longer hours then. And um, and my he was about a block and a half from where our apartment was initially until we moved. I was 13 years old, um, and um, I think you know if we could get away a day and a weekend and go to the beach, and my mother would you know you know pack a picnic for everybody, and we drive out to Long Island and spend the day out there, and you know, car we had, load roll up with everything. And so that was always an experience for me. I remember um, playing ball with my father, uh, playing baseball with my father. That was an experience that I look back on very fondly. And uh, playing football in, in high school. And um, I remember the debate my mother and father had whether or not they were going to let me play uh, football in high school. And um, my dad, it was probably just before he passed away, you know, Kind of expressed his view that you know that that's what I should do, or if that's what I wanted to do, that he was fine with it. Um, so obviously, I went on to play uh, football in high school. Um, but you know, he, as I said, he passed away when I was fifteen. So it was the early, very early part of my very limited football career on the field, unlike yours, Tim. Outside of football, did you have any interest in high school? Did you start your long distance running at Stuyvesant? Actually, um, I didn't really start running until I, um, I, I graduated college, um, started to work for this uh, large company, uh, you know, the parent company, the company's name was, was Dalen. And I had moved to Griffin, Georgia, which was the first city south of Atlanta. I was Then I was the CEO of this retail chain of drugstores, uh, Elliott Shrub drug start, stripe discount stores. And um, um, I went for my executive uh, exam, my physical exam at Scripps Clinic in San Diego. I remember the doctor there going over my family history and saying, you know, um, your father died from a heart attack at a very early age. Uh, so, you know, you need to be 
you know, very sensitive to, you know, what you can do to control your life and, you know, how long you're going to live, you know. So make sure you don't smoke, uh, make sure you don't drink in excess, make sure you're getting enough rest, make sure you're controlling stress in your life and get exercise, make sure you're getting exercise. And I really, really had not, you know, when I was youngster, when I was young, uh, whether it be pre-high school, public school, middle school, I mean, I was always involved with athletics, always moving, always running, always playing sports, et cetera. But after college, I really had stopped that. Um, so I, I remember I came back to Griffin and I picked up Dr. Ken Cooper's book on, um, on aerobics, the first book that uh, Dr. Cooper, who was really the father of preventative medicine in the United States, um, wrote on, on preventative medicine. Uh, and um, I went out and I did the one mile test that he had, uh, how long would it take you to run a mile, et cetera. A mile seemed like, God, that was like, you know, like running a marathon then to me. And um, I remember Diana followed me in the car to make sure I didn't like fall down or I could pick myself back up and get get back home again. And I was timed and then you ended up in a slot and that gave you a program to follow. And uh, I remember I started running in Griffin in the morning before I'd go to work. And uh, I remember people would say to me, I mean, this is back in 1970, and people would say to me, we saw you running. What? What is that about? What are you running for? I said, well, I'm just jogging. I'm just trying to get in shape and stay in shape and help my health, my, you know, physical health and mental health. And I realized over the years that running was important for me mentally as it was for me physically. Um, and so I think that became uh, just an integral part of my life for, you know, since, since that time. I really s didn't stop running until I developed bone on bone in my left knee and just couldn't run anymore. So, but I walk now and I, you know, do weights and other exercises, et cetera, to keep, uh, keep in shape. But, um, uh, that was very important to me. Very important to me. Uh, your first job out of college was as a senior accountant at an accounting firm. How did you manage to land that just out of college? You must've been brilliant. Well, I, I, when I worked, when I went to work for, for Arthur Young and company, I was the youngest, uh, accountant they had ever hired in the New York office. I wasn't even 20 years old then. I was just getting ready to turn 20. Um, so um, I, um, I went through college in three years. Babson at that time offered a three-year program, and I went through college in three years, which was not very smart. I should have taken, you know, four to five years and <laughs> enjoyed it along the way, and I'd recommend that for my own children and anybody else's kids for that matter. Um, just because it's a unique time in your life and both, you know, professionally to learn and grow, et cetera, but, you know, also socially and, and in terms of life experiences. But in any event, um, that was, um, you know, that was a, a great experience for me. I, I enjoyed it, um, learned a lot. We worked for a large public accounting firm. They could put money into training and exposure that a smaller firm could not have afforded to do. So I, I had an opportunity to do a lot of things, work for a lot of clients, um, did some important work, and enjoyed uh, learning the transition from college to uh, to the workforce. Yeah. And then, obviously, I left there after four years and went to work for the family business, which was a very different atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> did you like being an accountant? You know, Troy, it's a great question. So I... I um, uh, the answer is, I think it gave me great, a great background, a great ability to look at things uh, from 30,000 feet and get a full understanding of all the dimensions that go into a decision-making process in a business. Um, but I realized, particularly when I went to work for the, uh, the chain of drugstores I mentioned earlier, initially as their CFO and then eventually as the CEO, uh, that um, I really prefer to be on the other side of the desk where I was actually helping make decisions that were actually driving the business versus just reporting it and analyzing it. But I do think that background in accounting and finance and financial management was very helpful to me. To this day, I still have the ability to look at things from up here before I can dive down into the details, which I feel very comfortable doing, which is helpful to me, I would say. But I think that background was helpful, very helpful. 
Then you were hired by Daylin, a retail conglomerate, to be the president of one of their divisions. Were they an accounting client of yours and then they asked you to join them? Again, you must have been a superstar. Well, I don't know, a superstar. No, they, they were not a client. They, they, uh, uh, they, were, they were just the company that happened to acquire my mother's business. Uh, so, um, I mean, that was just, you know, um, uh, it was fortuitous. I mean, what was fortuitous about it was that, unfortunately for me, and it leads to the next chapter in my life, which is, you know, the uh, co-founding of the Home Depot, is that our business was very successful. A lot of their other divisions were not very successful. So we were running a, an expanding group of retail drug stores uh, and health and beauty aid stores throughout the Southeast, and we're, very, and we're making a lot of money. Um, but they could not continue to fund our support or grow, our, grow, our growth plans. So that was when I really was thinking about leaving because I just didn't want to sit on a on a you know set hand static hand for the you know for the foreseeable future. I was very young. I was twenty. What was I? I can't remember. I was twenty four or twenty five. I was very young to do what I was doing at that point. Um, but I was comfortable doing it. But I was very young to be doing it. So um, um, they said, "Listen, we don't have we don't have funds available. Our suggestion is that you know another step for you, maybe join this gentleman. The name was Bernie Marcus, who was running their discount department store division along with somebody else, and they had picked the other person to be the CEO of the discount department store. So they asked Bernie to go to California to run their starting home improvement center business, which was called Handy Dan, Handy Dan Home Improvement Centers." would you be willing to go out there and work with Bernie? And I said, yeah, I would be willing to. Uh, uh, and I was, you know, I, I didn't know much about California or Southern California. And uh, but we went out there and we were out there for four years and it was a great experience. I learned a lot. Uh, we uh, grew that business very successfully. We were running the best home improvement center uh, company in the United States uh, before the Home Depot. And, um, so uh, that was, you know, that was a unique experience with both. We both got fired together in, in 1978, same date in 1978. Um, one of our investors then said to us, who didn't realize at the time, the expression was, you just got, pardon the French, got kicked in the ass of the golden horseshoe, you just don't realize it. So you, if you want to, you know, start your own business, these investors who had invested in the public portion of our company, 20% of it was owned by the public, therefore protected by the SEC's rules and regulations, um, we would invest with you. So, you know, we sat down, Bernie and I sat down over a period of months and uh, drew up these plans for the Home Depot. Um, as successful as Handy Dan was, we knew we never could compete with a large, no frills, down market, big box stores with low prices, great assortments, great services, great service levels. So we said, okay, if we have a life of over again, we have folks who want to invest in us, why don't we try to do this? So we uh, spent some time developing a five-year plan, eventually, uh, and many versions of it, some of which were not even believable even to us, but uh, the volumes that we, we had to create to, to justify the resource investments. Um, we got a group of 44 investors, and they invested with us, and uh, the rest is history. Today, the company as um, a market value of probably $360 billion, uh, something in that range. So it's been, you know, one of the great American retail stories, success stories in the last 100 years in our country. And um, it's been the model for, you know, many other companies. But that's really where these business-oriented values and life-oriented values were developed Uh that we run our businesses by today, these six core values that we uh, talk about a great deal. And if you guys are running, I've heard the story before, I've read it in, in your book, Good Company, but for people who, who don't know, if you and, and Bernie are running the most successful branch they have, how do you guys end up getting fired? Well, you know, uh, uh, Joy, that's a good question. So uh, Bernie was the, uh, I, I was the uh, COO at that, at, that, at that point. Bernie was the CEO and the chairman of the company. And, um, uh, and I was the CFO for a while leading up to that. And then 
Bernie, uh, Bernie got into this political struggle with the guy that was the chairman of the parent company, a company called Dalen. Uh, and um, his name was Sandy Sigaloff. So um, he got in this political war with them. And uh, um, who was going to ha- take responsibility? Who was going to? Who was going to take responsibility? Who was going to have the credit, if you will, for the success of Handy Dan? And, of course, it really was the people running Handy Dan. It really had nothing to do with the parent company because we had this tax treaty with them and this protection from the, by the SEC. Um, but they didn't see it that way. So they wanted to own that success story. And so they fired Bernie and his right-hand guy, who was me. And uh, two of us, along with others, went off and started the Home Depot. That's, you know, 2,600 stores later, and, uh, you know, Home Depot has been an unbelievable. I often say it's like my seventh child um, in many ways. So, You guys have to send him a thank you card, send the, the company. Yeah, well, yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the people that helped finance the Home Depot was investment banker Ken Langone. You had a previous relationship yeah. with Ken before Home Depot. What was he like, and how did you know him? Uh, well, I knew Ken uh, from his uh, from his firm, his investment firm, um, and his firm was the one that really was the major uh, shareholder in uh, in Handy Dan, the public part of Handy Dan, and um, and Ken was the guy that put together these forty four individuals that collectively invested initially in in, uh, in the Home Depot. Ken was also responsible. His, his company was a company called in, in, Infamed, and um, uh, he was responsible for meeting meeting we had with Ross Perot. Ross Perot could have been, uh, probably should have been, but could have been uh, the single shareholder we had. Uh, it was a kind of a funny story. Bernie and I spent, along with Ken, probably spent five hours with him one afternoon going through our five-year plan with him, and he had just... Um, he had just retained uh, a gentleman who was the retired cha- who was a retiring chairman from Merrill Lynch as his uh, investment counselor, guidance guy, advisor, guru, etc. So he was in the room. Um, we found out later that this uh, guy from Merrill Lynch told Ross that Look, these guys are going to go broke. They're not going to make it. Their stores are going to be too big. Their prices are too low. They're going to have too many people on the floor. Their service levels are going to be too high. You know, it sounds good. They're never going to make it. So Ross did not invest with us. He could have. He didn't. You know, he could have bought half the company. Uh, but Ross actually became a, a really good friend. Uh, uh, he uh, When he ran for president, he would uh, often talk about the Home Depot and use as a model and our values the way we – treated our customers and our suppliers and our shareholders and our associates, et cetera. So um, he, uh, you know, he was, he was a big supporter, even though, um, you know, he didn't make that investment with us. No. You bought the Falcons in 2001, unfortunately, eight years after I retired. I was working for Fox Sports and you hired me as your preseason announcer. You shocked me by wanting to come into the booth in an attempt to further your knowledge of football in the NFL. Were you not a big football fan growing up? I would watch football with my dad, but I was much more interested in reading books. When did you become interested in the Atlanta Falcons? Well, I became interested when I moved to Atlanta in, uh, in 1978. Home Depot started in 79. Um, I became a season ticket holder. Um, and, uh, I didn't realize this until we bought the team in 2001, but the Atlanta Falcons, the franchise was awarded to the city of Atlanta, to the Smith family in 1966. It was the first season for the Falcons. And uh, they had never had back-to-back winning seasons. So at the closing, I remember saying that to the commissioner, Paul Tagliabue. Uh, well, he's seeing that, seeing that to me. He said, you really just bought a franchise. We've never had back-to-back winning seasons. I said, Paul, that can't be correct. And Paul was the smartest guy in the room. He would never tell you that, but he really was the smartest guy in the room. And um, went back and checked, and that turned out to be correct. But, you know, I, I really felt like in 2001 that I, when I was trans, trans transitioning out of the Home Depot after 23 years, that, you know, I could sit there and complain for the next 30 years of my life or try to buy the franchise and try to fix it, if you will. 
So I felt, you know, it's my nature and personality and, you know, the Green family knows this well is that I'd rather try to buy it and fix it or try to get in the middle of it and try to fix it uh, on behalf of really the community and the fans and do the best I could for the players and the organization. So we bought it in 2001 and that's been, you know, this is the year 2000, my 24th, 23rd season coming up this year. So it's been an incredible journey. And, uh, one of my blessings during that period of time was meeting you, Tim. And uh, the reason we got together is that, you know, I knew a fair amount from a business standpoint and I knew I could fill the stands or I thought I, I thought I could do that successfully, et cetera. But I really didn't know much. I mean, what I knew in high school about football was a thimble, maybe a half a thimble. Um, and Tim was, you know, obviously played the game at a very high level for the Falcons for many years and first round draft pick in 1986, as I remember. Um, and uh, incredible player, incredible leader, and a brilliant human being. But um, so I, you know, I said, let me, you know, see if I can, you know, spend some time with this gentleman. And he was kind enough. We went to dinner. He uh, talked to me about the team, what his view was, what we did well, what we could do better. And uh, really, over the over all those years, we developed this wonderful relationship. Uh, it started out originally around the Falcons, and then it just developed around family. So. Tim has been, uh, in many ways, uh, second, third father to all my kids. They all know Tim. They all love Tim. They all love the Green family. And uh, and I feel that way about, you know, Tim, Alyssa, and, and their children. They're all like family to me. Uh, so um, uh, I've learned so much over the years about football, about life, really. I would say even more about life with Tim and, you know, how to deal with, um, you know, challenges that uh, – put in front of you and you know how do you deal with them how do you live with them how do you grow through them how do you become a better person and uh you know the tim green story and it's not the purpose of this podcast but the tim green story is one of the great stories i've ever been exposed to in my life of human courage and human growth uh not only for tim but i would say for his entire family and uh so it's um it's an honor for me to spend any time with you and, and work with Troy in this case as well. So, um, remarkable human being. Uh, I don't know whether it's 40 books or 400 books. It could be, probably gonna end up being 400 books before you finish. Uh, <laughs> but, and uh, how you do that today is amazing to me, but it's a reflection of your will and your spirit and the kind of person you are. I appreciate the kind words, my friend. Since you have left the Home Depot, you have become the most popular owner in the NFL among the players. Your recent hiring of Raheem Morris has been the fulfillment of one of your goals of having more blackhead coaches in the NFL. I agree with you in full force. I called for more blackhead coaches 25 years ago in my book, The Dark Side of the Game. Please tell us about your philosophy on equal opportunity. Well, I think, Tim, that's what it really is. It's not... It's not that you're trying to hire uh, a blackhead coach. You're trying to hire the best head coach you can find, regardless of their color. Um, and I think uh, with Raheem, and there's a number of head coaches today, there's probably eight or nine of color today in the NFL. Um, I think that ownership and, and the league and organizations today in society recognizes that's really the right thing to do. And my mother had an expression, you do the right thing for the right reasons and live with the consequences. So I think that uh, people today are making more of those decisions, I think, than they ever have before, uh, with more still to come. Um, we just invited uh, four additional uh, limited partners, minority partners in, into, into the Atlanta Falcon Group. All four happen to be minorities. Um, and we did that really by design in this case, because we wanted to Make sure we have really good good role models that uh, encourage uh, other minority populations to not only be involved in the sport in a variety of different ways, but actually to own teams, uh, whether it be limited partners or eventually be principal owners. So uh, we want to set you know the best examples that we can in that uh, in that regard. And with sport and Tim, you you know this, and Troy, you play the sport, and you know this is that you know. 70% of the players in the, in the National Football League are, uh, are African American. So, you know, you want to have a, you want to have, see that kind of diversity 
you're not just on the field, but you want to see it in the coaching ranks. You want to see it in the front office. You want to see it, you know, throughout your organization, business, marketing, ticket sales, whatever it may be. So we, um, we're very much uh, committed to that. You have been and still are wildly successful, Arthur. You have imprinted your business philosophy on numerous businesses that you own, including PGA stores, the Atlanta United MLS soccer team, the award-winning Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and four Montana ranches. And you have a super yacht that runs like a Swiss watch. I know this firsthand because of your incredible generosity and the unforgettable week that me and my family spent cruising the Mediterranean. My question is whether or not you have had a low point in your life. And if you did, did you find consolation in your Jewish faith? My own experience with tragedy, and I am talking about living with an incurable fatal disease, my Christian faith has been my salvation. Yeah, <clears throat> Tim, that's a great, <clears throat> you know, that's a great, uh, great question. So I would say, um, my faith, and I think, you know, whether you're Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, whatever, whatever it may be, um, I think the notion of um, understanding life and relationships and feeling a purpose and understanding why we're here and how do we, in whatever stage of life we're dealing with, and sometimes it is adversity, uh, and sometimes it is overcoming hurdles, and sometimes it's overcoming hurdles that to others seem like impossible to get over. But you know, you're a unbelievable role model in that regard, uh, incredible role model in that regard. And um, so I, I think you know, relying on faith and relying on uh, everything relative to faith, that strength that we all find. In relationships, uh, in nature, in each other, um, in giving back, making a difference in other people's lives. I mean, the role model, you flip it around to you, Tim. I mean, the example that you set every day for, you know, other young men and women or older men and women that are uh, dealing with, you know, the, uh, the disease that you that you struggle with, ALS. Um, and, and you're facing and you're combating with, you know, not only on the ground in terms of the way you're living your life, but also research that you're helping fund and helping uh, find solutions uh, well in advance. You know, that's a beautiful thing to be part of. And uh, so it gives life a higher purpose, a bigger meaning um, than just getting by from day to day and how to acquire another thing, whatever it may be. And I think my experience in life is that um, my greatest success is not about things, but it's more about people. It's more about living life fully. It's more about building the kind of relationships and setting yourself up as a role model for other people and how to create more opportunities for others and how to create a better life journey, potential experience for other people. Uh, I mean, that's a beautiful thing to be part of. So um, as incredible success you have had in your life, you know, as a, you know, collegially and playing football, you know, collegially and professionally and all the books you've written and what have you. But, you know, the way you've uh, led now, in my view, with your life um, and, and the vision that other people see in that and can learn from that is, uh, is an incredible gift uh, to humanity. Um, so I, not I love you, but I salute you. And uh, your philosophy is a uh, philosophy of your life is a treasure to all of us who are connected to you. So um, we appreciate that. As usual, it was a pleasure to talk with you. I truly can't imagine how you do it all. May God continue to bless you and your family, my brother. I love you. No, thank you. Tim, Tim, I, you know, I, I love you as well as my brother, truly. Um, and I would say that, you know, uh, people often ask me, I was going to comment this earlier. Um, I, this might be one of your questions that we're not going to get to, but I'm going to guess here is that what are you most proud? And I look back and I would say, you know, I have six incredible children that, you know, now that I'm older and they're, they're older too, but, you know, that I really am older. 
they choose to spend time with me, um, you know, tells me as a friend, a father, a parent, uh, that I've done, I've done a good job in that regard. And, um, well, the business success is incredibly important. Well, the philanthropy success is incredibly important, but my relationship with my children is at the heart of everything that I do. And I'm blessed because somebody asked me this the other day, what do I like doing the most every day now? And I'd say, well, actually, there's nothing I do every day that I don't love. It's all work. It's all fun for me. It's all purpose related. It all is very fulfilling for me. So um, I'm very fortunate where I am in my life. It's amazing. Arthur, the last question we ask everybody before they go is if, if you had to recommend somebody you know personally that we should have on as, an, as a guest in the future, who would you recommend? Uh, you know, I just I spent an hour I spent an hour this afternoon on the on the phone with the uh, on a virtual call with the uh, Surgeon General of the United States, um, Dr. Murphy. I don't know if he, you know, has the time. Would give you the time. I mean, probably give you the time if he had the time. Uh, but incredibly inspirational, um, not just doctor, but you know, viewpoint, philosophy of life, and and uh, and view on life. If you can't reach him, I would say somebody else we've done a great deal of work with, which I think would be very much connected to the work that Tim is doing, Dad's doing, that Mom's doing, you're doing, Troy, brother, sister, um, are all doing, um, is Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob Waldinger. So uh, Dr. Waldinger is the um, professor at Harvard. He's a psychiatrist, but professor at Harvard who's in charge of their 100 year story, 100 year work, research work on what makes people happen. He's written several books now, et cetera. But the research and how that connects to living with purpose and living with what life deals you deals with you in terms of the kind of uh, hurdles that we all have to overcome and his philosophy about relationships and philosophy about life and how it connects to. He's also a, 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 a um, a Buddhist monk um, in terms of religion and faith and all that plays a big part of it. So that would be mm-hmm. another recommendation. He may be more reachable than the Surgeon General. Surgeon General, if you could reach him, would be unbelievable. Both, so. both amazing. Thank you. All right, guys. Take care. I love you both. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barclay Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to barclaydamon.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nurse Core for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to tackleals.com for cutting edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you wanna make a contribution, go to tackleals.com.